everybody at this time, let me get down to my, get to my here. Um, I want to thank Police Credit Union for sponsoring this Leeds series. For over 65 years, the Police Credit Union has been providing financial solutions to take care of our own, exclusively serving law enforcement professionals and their family members throughout California. They proudly provide banking solutions, including checking accounts, home and auto loans, credit cards, online services, and more. As your financial partner, the Police Credit Union is committed to helping you succeed financially, whatever your stage of life. So we thank the Police Credit Union for being our exclusive one source premier financial partner and for sponsoring our Leeds series. Um, my name is Carol Leveroni. I am the executive director for the California Peace Officers Association. And we wanna welcome you to our 2021 Leeds conversation series. As was the intent last year when this was created, the series is meant to briefly address the most current of topics so that profession, this profession can stay informed, connected, and well. As we close the door on 2020, concern for the health and well being of law enforcement and their families continues to be of great importance to CPOA. The pandemic, quarantining, health concerns, civil unrest, law enforcement scrutiny, I'm exhausted just saying it, so I can only imagine the stresses you and your families have been under. This is why we're so pleased to bring you today's speaker. Dr. Ellen Kirschman has worked as a clinical psychologist treating first responders, cops, and firefighters who suffered with work-related traumatic stress for decades. Her book, I Love a Cop, was first published in 1997 and is on its third edition. She is with us today to have a conversation about the current stressors law enforcement and their families are coping with and how to maintain a strong family union, unit. While today's session is structured in an interview fashion, again, please feel free to use the chat box to ask questions and we will attempt to respond to them as time permits. Um, be sure to stay uh, with us to the end for a special offer from Dr. Kirschman. Okay, so with that, welcome Dr. Kirschman. Mm -hmm. um, let's kind of jump right in. Uh, Pre-March 2020, let's go back there. Uh, the policing and the stresses that accompany it already made relationships challenging. Now you have officers fighting to bring bringing COVID back to their families or of catching it themselves, spouse and or their partners who remain at home either now alone or homeschooling the children, the loss of connection to friends and family, uh, the scrutiny and negativity over policing over, over the policing profession. What do you want to say to the officers and their families on the call and what should they be doing to maintain a healthy and strong connection? Thanks, Carol. And I'm, uh, I was really pleased to be invited to do this because it is so important. And uh, as you said, there is just an enormous amount of stress, probably unparalleled. I've been doing this for 40 years. Maybe this is about as high as it's ever gotten in terms of my, uh, from my perspective. Um, and while what I'm going to say is probably true for the non-crisis kinds of times, I think it's even more important um, right now. So the first thing is, the biggest challenge you're going to have is to fight negativity because it's coming at you from everywhere um, as a family. Uh, one of the psychologists that I really admire a great deal is a guy named Dr. John Gottman. He's up in uh, Seattle and he does some um, evidence-based research kinds of stuff. So it's not sort of loosey-goosey hot tub kind of California psychology. It's really got some um, uh, grounding in statistics and in laboratory research. And he talks about the fact that you want to try to treat your relationship with your family or maybe with your friends, if you're not uh, married or don't have kids, kind of like a bank account. I like this metaphor because it's easy to understand. The more positivity you deposit in your bank account, the more stable your relationship and the balance of your relationship will be when some negativity hits. That would be, the negativity would be like a withdrawal. So you wanna keep that 
your balance of positivity way higher than the negativity. And when negativity occurs, because it will occur in every single relationship, I mean, we think all couples have about 10 irreconcilable differences from the get-go. You shouldn't try to change them. All you can do is manage them. You cannot change each other. I mean, if anybody here has ever been on a diet, um, you know how hard it is to even change yourself and your own habits. So the idea that we might change somebody else to suit ourselves is pretty much of a fantasy. So you want to learn to manage these through accommodation and through negotiation, um, those kinds of differences. Uh, but if you've got a lot of positive interaction going in your family, when, when you get into loggerheads with somebody in your family, it's going to feel less um, critical. It's going to feel more like a sort of a blip on the screen rather than, uh, than a big crisis. So the, how do you put positivity in a relationship? I mean, nothing enormous. It's the little stuff. I'm not talking about a carnival cruise line whenever we'll ever take those again, but a cruise line where you're standing, you know, in the moonlight in your evening clothes, drinking champagne. That's not what I'm talking about. Not talking about big presents. I'm talking about um, paying attention to each other being present when you're together and, uh, and really interested in, which, in what each other's saying. A little smile, handing each other a cup of coffee the way you like your coffee fixed, thanking somebody for something they did, just the real small stuff. The more of that that you can do authentically, don't make this stuff up, of course, uh, the, the, the better and higher your balance of positivity will be in your relationship. The other thing is that, you know, fighting. Um, all couples fight. When things go wrong, it's not about the fighting, it's about the inability to repair the damage from a fight. So you need to know how to do that and you need to know when it's better to cool down and um, take a break. You need to understand that, at, and I, this is what I will tell all of the spouses, the non-enforcement spouses who are listening in. Listen, if you don't know how to be assertive, you're married to a trained interrogator. You'll never get any price. So you really need to know how to express yourself, but to do so in a way that is not insulting or critical. And that would go for both partners in a relationship. And we find sometimes that um, law enforcement officers bring some of their street skills home when they shouldn't. They might be too, um, uh, too angry, too rough, um, use language or sarcasm, stuff that might work okay on the street from time to time, but it doesn't work with your family and it shouldn't. Um, and so that's one of the, that's one of the things that I would suggest if, to kind of examine how it is when you do have fights, can you repair the damage if any damage was done? And then I would say if you, any families that if you're having a relationship problem, get help sooner rather than later, because it's, it's hard, it, there's less goodwill if you let um, a difficult relationship go on for too long. There is less goodwill left and you're, you're presenting the therapist with a way harder job. So and we think many marriages seem to fall apart in the first couple of years, but we find that most people don't go for help. Uh, it takes them about seven years to ask for help. And we'll talk more likely why that is that it's hard for cops to ask for help. But those are some of the kind of general um, thoughts I have about managing, um, managing a relationship with a cop. It isn't any different than managing a relationship. We all have these same problems. There are things that are very unique for police officers and we'll be talking about those um, as Carol asks me some more questions. Yeah, in fact, that was a perfect segue. So in your book, I Love a Cop, you state, nothing worth doing is easy. And that includes loving a cop. Of course, I see there's two sides to that, that comment, right? So let's start with the first. And you touched on a couple of these, but what do you want an officer's family to know about their loved one and their chosen profession? Well, that this is not just a job. For most cops, this is an identity. It is 
they, who they think that they are. And very often to the uh, exclusion of other roles that they have in life, such as parent, friend, child, brother, sister, church member, soccer player, whatever. So it's, it is really um, critical because we all need our identities. And, and when you have this, I think Kevin Gilmartin talks about it as a case of a single identity. When that, that one identity, being a cop, um, supersedes everything else in your life, then you're essentially placing too much, um, uh, too much of your self-esteem um, in the one basket in your life over which you probably have no control. It, you know, cops don't control criminals. They don't control their chiefs. They don't control politics. So um, that's kind of a dangerous thing to do, to think of yourself only as this is who I am, because most of us have very many roles in life, not, not just a single role. The other thing I guess I tell families, and I, this makes very often makes some cops um, kind of shudder when I say it, but one of the occupational hazards of being a police officer is self-inflation. It's thinking you know more than anybody else and civilians are naive, um, haven't got a clue about what's happening. Well, to some degree that may be true because you all see the police officers see more things uh, in the first couple of years in, of their careers than the rest of us will ever see in an entire lifetime. So yes, you do have some views of humanity and of what the kind of cruelty and difficulty that people uh, can get into. Um, but that doesn't mean that your opinion, that a police officer's opinion matters more than anybody else in the family. So it's um, that, that self-inflation and dismi being dismissive of the people in your family or your spouses or, or your friends or your family because um, you may think that we don't know what we're talking about is very damaging. And it really isn't true. It really isn't true. What you know is the small slice of life that you see in your job, but you don't see other things. I mean, it, I often make the joke that if we were to judge police officers by the people who show up in my office, you'd have a whole different view of cops than you would if you looked at the entire, it's a sampling era. You cannot make those assumptions based on the small slice of humanity that you see as an officer. And I guess the other thing I would say, Carol, to families is that the, that the reason cops have such a difficult time getting help when they need it in a timely way. Well, there's several reasons for it. Sometimes there is no help available or no trusting culturally competent help available. That's another problem. That's not within the purview of an individual cop. But the idea that um, there's so much stigma against seeking help because people think that means you're weak. I think it means you're human. I mean, how else can you do this in most impossible job in the world, the most difficult job in the world? You have to be so many different things in this job. Um, it's of course expected that the job is going to wear on you. And some, I was just talking with a cop I haven't seen for a few years. He's retired, but we were, we were pretty close when, we, when he was working. And he said, this job is failing cops. And it's true. I think some of the idealism that people have brought to this job, given our current situation and the atmosphere and the social unrest and all the millions of things that are going on, that the, the, there's a great deal of demoralization and a great deal of loss of um, your original motivation. So what, of course you're going to need some help. Um, it just makes you. It just makes you human. So if you, and there are many, many other reasons, the primary one, I, I blog with psychology today and I just wrote a blog about this. Fear about confidentiality is, is probably the primary reason that many cops will not seek therapy. So if you're a family member and you're trying to get your officer to see somebody, you're gonna run and you're gonna run into a whole lot of resistance um, that you'll need to work on relentlessly, but gently. So, um, uh, so my next question is going to be actually about that. So I'm going to come back to it, but I, I'm also going to use the 
um, the moment to reference um, the, some of the YouTube videos that we did early during the pandemic, which again are on our YouTube channel, uh, um, as well as if you go to CPOA's training portal, we have our virtual conference that we did that again, we covered those topics that you're talking about and creating officer wellness and how, you know, one of the overwhelming um, fears and the, during the chats on those was it's, it's, our agencies will say that we support this and we want you to be healthy, but culturally that isn't necessarily being implemented. And so there is that disconnect between wanting to help, an agency wanting to help and have healthy um, officers and then some of this, these other fears that come through. So I just wanted to mention that um, we did have videos on that that you can go look at, but so absent, knowing that an officer is going to be reluctant to perhaps reach out on their own, um, how else can officers, families, what can they do to, in, in being supportive during these stressful times to the officers? Well, there, there are several things. I mean, uh, um, your um, comment about what other people were commenting on about their fear of uh, that, that if they sought help, that there'd be some negative consequences to them. I'd be very curious to know if those negative consequences, if they think they're coming from admin, from the administration or from their fellow officers. Um, it, was both. it was both. It was both? Yeah. Okay. Because one thing we can do about stigma is not contribute to it. Right. Uh, you know, if you, if you see somebody needs help and if you, particularly if you've had some help yourself that worked for you, open up about that. Go, go to the, that person's uh, clinician for the first visit. Go along, offer, offer to be helpful because I think a great deal of the stigma comes from other line level officers. And that while the, there may be agencies that um, will be punitive towards somebody who has sought help in my 40 years of experience, that is really rare that that happens and that officers being kind of skeptical types um, uh, really don't believe that, the, that confidentiality will be held by the therapist. But I can tell you that, that most of us would rather, and, and I know some people who've actually gone to jail, some therapists rather than give up information about a client. So the, what families can do is so number one, the, every, see one of the, one of the both blessings and burdens about being a cop or being married to one is that cops have two families. You've got your, what I call your real family, and then you've got your work family. And uh, your work family, you know, they promise to have your back. And when you're hired, they will seduce you into the job and say, uh, you know, no matter what you do, you're part of the blue. And, you know, we have all these wonderful slogans. But in fact, in many cases, that family turns out to be quite fickle. And I think I think I will, uh, I'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. So, but to get, so to get back to what um, your real families can do, they need their own support systems. They need it beyond what you have to deal with because you've got it at work. They don't have it at home unless they have some kind of a job that provides it or they've got family in town. So it really helps to get to know other um, police families to build um, networks. Um, the agencies could do a lot by building networks and having family orientation so that families can meet one another. I think it's also important, and I probably make this point over and over again in about a million different ways. It's important for a family to figure out what it is you have control over and what it is you don't have control over. For about the last um, 10 plus years, I've been a volunteer clinician for the First Responder Support Network, which runs two retreats. Uh, one called the West Coast Post Trauma Retreat, and it's for um, the first responders who are struggling with traumatic stress, and then one for significant others and their spouses called the SOS Retreat. And up there, we talk about the donut. We get this big wooden sign and we pull it out. So if you can, for a moment, imagine, um, visualize a donut. In the center part of the donut, the, the, the hole there where there's really nothing, 
we say that that's what you have control over in your life. Your emotions, your reactions, your ethics, your professionalism, um, your thoughts, uh, your behavior, that's all in that donut hole. In the out, outer part, the part of the donut that you actually eat, um, that's your sphere of influence. You have no control, but you have influence there. And we get influenced by being good, good communicators, by being emotionally intelligent, meaning we know how to read ourselves and read other people. Um, we can articulate things um, and, and be, uh, communication's a big part of it. And we have negotiating skills and so forth. That's how you make your sphere uh, of influence. And outside, beyond the donut in the whole rest of the whole world is everything else that's there over which you have zip control. So I think it's really important for those of us uh, in figuring out what do we have control over? There's a lot that's going on in the world now over which many of us don't have any control and feeling helpless is a terrible thing to feel. And it's especially terrible if you're a cop because your self, your belief in yourself is that you are a person who is effective. You can solve problems. People are better off because you are there. You can take care of stuff. And to feel helpless is pretty awful. It's also, again, pretty human and very often a consequence of being caught in a place where you, if you really take a realistic look at it, you don't have any control. I mean, I see a lot of times where cops get enormously upset with something that the, their chief of police did. You know, enormously upset. There, there they are, putting all those eggs back in the basket over which they have no control. And my question usually is, do you think you can control your chief? So if you can't, you know, think about something you have some control over. Because um, that makes you miserable. You just keep throwing yourself at the wall over and over and over again, trying to change something, and you have no ability to change it. So uh, very often, when if you're living as a family member with somebody who is really in trouble, or you, you know, your family members are your first. They're your first responders. They're the ones who know that you're not sleeping at night. They're the ones who know that you're checking the front door six and seven times, <laughs> make sure it's locked. They're the ones who know you have nightmares or you're drinking more than you used to drink. Um, so th they need to figure out for themselves what they can and can't do to help you. And, uh, and that's, a, that's a really important tool, I would say, for all families to have. Um, to hook up with other police families, to not lose your non-police friends, to have some kind of a spiritual connection in your life, you know, something that's bigger than you are, whether that's religion or, or not religion, and to be able to have good self-care. Uh, sometimes at the retreats we see, um, uh, most of the time it's women, but not all of the time, who have um, so uh, been so much self-sacrifice to their law enforcement mate because law enforcement was the most important thing and they were not as important. And they have really, they arrive at the retreat, they're exhausted, demoralized, uh, don't know what, don't know their own minds anymore don't know what they want and their self-care is terrible because they're so busy taking care of everybody else. Uh, doesn't work. And if you don't take care of yourself, you don't have anything left over for anybody else. Okay, so so I know this next question I'm, I'm really curious about because I know even in my family, this has uh, definitely become um, more at the forefront given everything, how, how do families talk to their children about the dynamics of law enforcement, systemic racism, and how to ensure the safety of both the law enforcement family and those who seek to raise awareness about historic injustices? Well, uh, this question uh, came to us from somebody who I hope is in, uh, in the group, I guess, and it's a really important question. What I'm hearing from a great many of my colleagues is that these issues um, uh, about historic injustices and about um, 
uh, racism uh, have, are tearing families apart. And it's um, tearing couples apart. And it's, so these are an enormous issues and they're kind of, I think they're new-ish because um, just because things are so heated in our environment and because we are all in our own little echo chambers and not really talking across uh, across uh, echo chambers with each other. Um, I would say for kids, now mind you, I, I'm not a child psychologist and I don't have children. So take this all with a grain of salt. I think the answer to that question certainly has to be uh, dependent upon the age of the child. There are some things that teenagers are going to be uh, need and want that little children may be aware of uh, what's going on in the world, but they may not understand it. So obviously that has to, uh, that has to be taken into account. Um, I think that it's probably more important in dealing with children to listen than it is to talk, to try to figure out what their understanding is I mean, I know parents sometimes feel obliged to fix something or solve a problem or explain something. And there are some things that are beyond words and can't be explained. So I would want to know from a child what they understand about what's going on. They may have a completely um, uh, offbeat understanding. I mean, sometimes after there's an officer killed in the line of duty, then children are terribly frightened and they think all cocks will die. So that would be a small child, of course, that did that. Um, and you know, we saw after the uh, events of September 11th, children that watched too much television um, were uh, thinking this, that uh, planes were flying into buildings all over the United States. So I think being careful with your child's um, diet of media and social media is important. Um, to make sure that if they're getting information off social media or off the news that they're getting it from as neutral as possible a source as they can get it. I mean, allow them to ask any of the questions they want. There are no bad questions, but it's perfectly okay as a parent to say, I don't know the answer to the question uh, about that. Um, how would what would you think or how would you like to see what's going on in the in the future and here's here's how I feel today um, this is really hard for me to hear people saying bad things about dad dad's a really good person and and just um, try to figure out what the, your child's concern is um, rather than uh, um, overload them perhaps with too much information. It's probably coming from a place of concern, fear, upset, something they may be, check what they're hearing at school, make sure that their teachers know that they have police officers for parents and that, um, that this is a, a very tense and difficult moment for police officers and that no one should ever assume that because you're a cop, you're a racist, um, you know, so uh, these are very uh, delicate conversations to have. And I, I hope that those, I mean, let your child tell you what their concern is and then restate that concern back to them so that you are certain that you've heard it correctly. Um, and then, um, you know, you won't change anybody else's mind. Sometimes the best you can do is agree to a disagree on things and to try to do so um, with respect. Uh, it's, I know it's really hard to be blamed for all of the ills of society, which seems to be what is happening. And that maybe you just say to your child, what you're trying to do is to understand how we as a society got to where we are today and that you're hoping for a better future for everybody. I think that's a really great point. And I, and I would, I would suggest that it's not, these conversations aren't just with their children, right? Like I, I know just by the nature of, of who I work on behalf of, 
my parents, my friends, people will call me and say, I know you work with law enforcement. Can you explain to me why um, this, these kind of, how they feel this way or why they think this? And I, and so I, I do think that, um, you know, obviously I have a strong uh, sense of alliance with who I work on behalf, correct? But it, that point that you just made about saying, and this is what I said to my children when, you know, my, he's in college and he is getting all that social media input and he wanted to tell me what's going on, right? And I just said, you know what, all I ask is that you look at both sides of this and that um and that you're open about what the solution is and and, and that's really kind of my messaging to people because it is it's I, it's hard it's hard to defend who you are and who you work on behalf of when um when some of the beauty is that we really do have an insider knowledge right we we know what is true and what doesn't seem to be true mm-hmm. but there's so many people out there that don't and and again for i know for me just being able to spread those little kernels of don't believe everything you hear and you're really that concerned, go find out, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. go explore it. Those are great points, Carol. And I and many of my colleagues have been talking about this uh, nonstop for, for quite a while. I'm, and I, I've had a couple of really bad days myself, um, similar to what you're describing, either people calling me and saying, what's the matter? I mean, I get it from both sides. Um, as to you, I happen to be a, a liberal person, and so some of the cops, some cops are mad at me because I'm I'm a liberal, and yet I've I'm been doing this work and supporting police for forty years, and I and have this understanding of how things work that most people don't have a clue about it. So it's like I and I'm trying to always take that middle road, and um, uh, so. I've had some um, trolls, I think they call them, some police, not patrols, but police trolls on my case. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, uh, it's uh, very painful when it happens. And I'm not the only psychologist. A lot of us are, have been struggling with this ourselves. So I have uh, two more topics to kind of cover. So I'm going to go back to that other side of the coin. And again, you, you addressed a little bit of this along the way, but on the other side of the coin, um, what do you say to, what what do you say to officers whose loved ones share the unique burden and fellowship of loving them? And what role do they play, the officer, in their mental wellness and in strengthening their relationship? Okay, so I I mentioned one of these things before, you know, the, the, you have, cops have two families, their uh, work family and their real family. And this is a blessing and a burden both. And, and remind you that your work family can be very fickle. Um, and the, the reason for that is that the organizations exist for their own survival, not for the survival of individuals in them. They're good people in organizations, but basically organizations just uh, are, exist for their own survival. I don't know how else to say that. I would tell officers, and we say this at the retreat a lot, if you think your job doesn't follow you home, you're fooling yourself. Your family's reading you the minute you walk in the door and they're looking for what we have come to call the face. They don't know. Do you have that look, you know, on your face because you've had a bad day at work or are you mad at us or me? And it's really important common courtesy for heaven's sakes to tell your family what's going on with you. And a lot of cops say, hey, I don't want to bring this stuff home. I want my house to be a sanctuary. And that's a lovely thought, except it doesn't work because um, if your family loves you and pays attention to you, they're going to notice that you've got a shorter fuse or you're more irritable or you, you know, you took an extra, had an extra beer or something. So um, I like to say to cops, look, this is not black and white. It's not tell all or tell nothing. You know, what your family really wants to know is what kind of a mood are you in and does it have anything to do with us? And is there anything we can do for you to help? Um, 
And I tell families, you know, sometimes the officers, they're just sick of talking about stuff at work. They've been debriefed and over and over again. They don't, they want a break from the misery or whatever they had on their shift that day and all the days before. So they won't really want to, it's not a personal insult that they don't want to talk, but it would be really great if they are, because just because you love someone doesn't mean you can read their mind. So it'd be really great if, um, the officer could say, you know, I've had a really crappy day at work. I saw something I hope never to see in my whole life again. And, and I, I, what I really need now is for us all to, in, in days before the pandemic, I need us all now to like go out, get a pizza, take a walk. I need to run around the block and just say what it is that you, that you need that might help you um, feel better. And, and again, you do have, I mean, I would suggest having that family, that conversation about how to talk to each other, and what to say. I mean, I've dealt with the um, couples where the, the non-enforcement spouse will say, look, I, tell me anything you want about what happens to you at work unless it involves children. I just can't do that. So you make, you negotiate with each other. Don't hit, here's a cop thing that I hear a lot. Don't hit me with problems the minute I open the door. I've been solving problems all day long. Give me a break. So these are negotiable things. And just the police officer does not get to decide those things unilaterally. unilaterally. In a family, that should be something that is worked out early on, if you can. But if you haven't done it, do it now. Um, and try to have those conversations with each other about when do we want to talk, where do we want to talk, what do we want to talk about. Um, I think that also that it's really, again, for the off, it's the officer's responsibility to monitor your own mental health and your own well being. And as I said earlier, and probably say for a million years, um, don't wait too long. If you think you got a problem, if you think you're, if you think, if you're feeling just un miserable, uncomfortable, bad mood, don't know why, get some help. Don't push that on your family because they're going to notice it. Okay, so so it looks like we're getting close to the end here. So before we go, a couple things for anybody out there. If you have any questions you want to put in the chat box, we are monitoring that. Or if you want to raise your hand and ask a question, please do so now. Um, but uh, is there anything that we've missed talking about, Ellen, or are there any resources you'd like to share with those on the call so that they can explore this issue further? Okay, well, um, of course, my book, I Love a Cop. If you're uh, uh, in a police family, whether you're the officer or whether you are the spouse, um, I think I wrote this book for you guys uh, to sort of help. So, and my publisher will offer you a 25% discount. You go to guilford.com, that's G-U-I-L-F-O-R-D.com and use the code A-F-2-E. And we we're going to put that in the chat box, by the way. Right. So, so they'll give you a 25% discount. I also blog with Psychology Today. I uh, put something up every month, and it is for police officers. And it's a range of topics that affect police officers and their families. Right now, I'm sort of doing a, a, a series about um, therapy. What's, what is therapy like? How do you find a therapist? I my the last one was, can you trust a therapist? I'm talking about the rules of confidentiality. Um, and on my website, ellenkirschman.com, you will find a whole bunch of other resources, including a discussion guide for the book, I Love a Cop. And if you are seeing a therapist who is unfamiliar with law enforcement, I recommend you try to find someone who is what we call culturally competent. In other words, they know what cops do and why you do it. And they, so they'll know also how your family, um, what your family's dealing with because the culture is so important. And because as Carol said earlier, so few people really understand what your job is like. If, if, this, if you don't have any other options but to talk with somebody, or maybe you just like this person who's unfamiliar with it, um, uh, there's a book that I wrote called Counseling 
what clinicians need to know. And I wrote that with Mark Kamina and Joel Fay, both of whom were psychologists and retired cops. So uh, it's not a book that you should pick up and it'd be too sort of boring for you guys, but um, for anybody that's not a clinician, but if it's a clinician, they could help. And then if anybody has further questions we don't get to today, feel free to um, contact me through my website. There's a, a, a way to email me through my website. It's pretty obvious. And I also have a newsletter that you can sign for as well. And, and that will automatically send you my blogs as, from Psychology Today. Okay, well, great. Listen, I want to extend my deepest appreciation to you for spending this time with us today, um, as you and your publisher for for providing that discount to those that were on the call. So that information is in the chat box. Uh, again, we extend our thanks to the Police Credit Union for being our exclusive one source premier financial partner and for sponsoring this leads series. Uh, continue to stay connected and enhance your professional and personal skills with upcoming virtual offerings from CPOA, which are on the screen right now. And you can visit CPOA.org for more details and to sign up. And again, Dr. Kirschman, thank you so much. And uh, we will be posting this probably by tomorrow on our YouTube channel. So I'll send you the link for that. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me and everybody be well and stay safe. Thank you. Yeah, I can look at